Hello, and welcome to the virtual Nordic and Baltic Oscar Contender Series presented by Scandinavia House in New York and the Scandinavian Film Festival of Los Angeles with the Baltic Film Expo at SFFLA. Today we're talking with Finnish director Klaus Haro, the director of the new film Life After Death, screening virtually this weekend. Klaus has been a favorite of both Scandinavia, both institutions since its inception, um, and he's been nominated numerously for the best international feature film with films such as Elena, As If I Wasn't There, Mother of Mine, Letter to Father Jacobs, and The Fencer. The Fencer was made the short list in 2016. Speaking with Klaus today is Jim Kooning, the director and founder of the Scandinavian Film Festival of Los Angeles. Welcome Klaus and welcome Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you and Klaus it's so good to to see you and have you have you with us. Um, I've often told you you've been a favorite of our of our Scandinavian Film Festival LA audiences. You, the first film of yours we screened was in 2002. That's 20 years ago. I can't believe it's it. It's been a while. Yes. It's, it's been a while. But consistently when I talk when I talk with about the festival with people and they recall the different years they'll start describing some film oh do you remember that film where and I, and I'll and it, it will almost always be one of your films so they 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 have staying power they stick with people um and i i think the same will be true of, of your your film life Life After Death, um, lovely, lovely film. And I I, I know it has some person, I, I love the, the disclaimer at the beginning of the film when you, where you say all similarities to, to uh, real people Actual. are intended. Yes. <laughs> so tell us about that. Uh, yes. Well, if you say, Jim, if you say that my films uh, stick, uh, this certainly has been with me for quite a while. I think I wrote the first draft when I was 23 or 24. I was still in film school and my mother has, had just passed away at an early age, as a young age, uh, relatively at least. And, and I remember at the time of mourning when I wanted to be with my family and and, and remember my mom and talk about my mom. It seemed to me at the time that everybody was busy doing anything, everything else, anything apart from mourning. So, you know, there were arguments of whether we should have tea or coffee at the memorial service or, or this or that. And, and I just felt that if this wasn't so sad, it would almost be funny. And I'd made some notes uh, at the time and, and Soon I wrote a script, uh, which was more like a stage play than an actual film script. And I've had that stage play in my bedside table, I guess for 20 or 25 years, I would take it out ever so often, read it to myself and laugh and say, well, it's quite funny, but who's interested? And I would put it back. It's so personal, it's so, it's so tiny in a way. And I was just completing uh, one last deal and I took it out again and I read it and my wife would comment on this and say, well, you waited for 25 years. What are you going to do? Like wait for 25 more years or what? And that sort of got me thinking. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And somehow, I guess, professionally, I was ready to do it because what I had was more or less long monologues or dialogues, 10 page dialogues. And it didn't seem like a movie, but when I started writing and with all, you know, having made a certain amount of movies, I, I felt confident that I can turn this into a small, very personal uh, film that I'm now happy to screen at these events. And, and are the characters actually, are you portraying your family members or are they well, are yes. the characters based yeah. on... Yeah, I mean, it is a, basically it's a story about a father and a son uh, who are both mourning, but they're doing it in very different ways. Yeah. And so, it, so, uh, so, and, and then other relatives come in and, and they don't make it easier for them. So yes, these are actual characters, or let's say they're based on actual characters. Of course, the disclaimer, which is no disclaimer, uh, but, but rather confirming that this is true, is kind of a, a comic hint 
and, and making fun of all the disclaimers, especially in American movies. And, and, and so, but yeah, it, it is, let's say the father in the film has many features of my father. He was a, 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 a man like many Finnish men, men who, who was very shy to talk about his feelings. And the harder it gets, the harder the, the, the sort of the, the thing was for him, the more he would shut up and, and not be able to talk about it. I think that's very common in Scandinavia. And I can say I was lost in many ways, like the young man in the film is lost and doesn't really know what to do about the situation. Now, to be honest, I think I was more aggressive than the young kind man in the film and my father wasn't quite as angry as the man in the film. So it's also dramatized and we've added quite some spices in the film. But these people in the film, and I hope are, are based on actual people, and I hope I treat them with love and understanding, uh, even if there are some harsh notes as well. Uh, you treat them with much love and understanding and, and, and res respect. Uh, they're all of the different relationships that you explore, the father-son, the father with his sister, the father with his mother-in-law, um so many relationships and of course uh at, at an intense time after someone has passed away um all of all of these come come to the to the fore uh, i think an important character uh who is omnipresent but silent in the film is death Yes. So you're being very Scandinavian in 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 that res yes. respect. Yes, but but I, I still wanted to make the film a comedy, or at least ha let it have comic elements. Let's put it that way. It's maybe not a comedy, but it has comic elements. But I didn't want it to be a dark comedy. I don't especially enjoy black humor, dark humor myself. I I tend to always look at people, even people that I disagree with. I tend to to look at them with a, a certain amount of empathy and understanding or trying to understand them, or, or if not empathy, maybe some sadness. And, and I hope uh, with this film, people can sort of feel that they can so, somehow understand all the characters. Uh, yeah. You could hardly say it's a dark comedy. And it's, there's a com comedy for sure. Uh, but it's not a dark comedy because you have the battle of the chandeliers. Yes. Of the, yes. Of the light fixtures. Um, <laughs> tell us about that a little bit more. What? Old classic and... You, you mean, you, are you referring now to cinematography or...? No, to the, to the crystal chandelier. Oh, yes. Oh, that one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that, that, that is the kind of situations that I'm sure uh, very, very sort of familiar in many families uh, that you 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 argue about old things and you you remember things differently and you say it was this way. No, it was that way. He used to like this this thing. Now he used to like that thing, and and especially sister and brother, if they're elderly and if they didn't get along when they were kids or when they were young adults, it usually doesn't get any better unless something really happens. And I, I'm always waiting for that reconciliation between people. I mean, I've seen that too in people's life that, that people say, wait, wait, what are we doing? We're wasting our lives being bitter. Let's be friends. And, 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 I, and, and, and I'm always hoping for that to happen. And, and in many films and many of my films, you've seen that reconciliation between people who sort of say, Let's forget about the past and let's from here on let's be friends. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't happen with this sister and brother in these films who 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 want things to be differently. I mean, the father is inhabiting, is living in the house that used to be the childhood home of his sister as well. And when she comes to visit, she wants it to look the way it always looked, or the way she remembers that it always looked, uh, even if it didn't. So that's a constant argument in this family. I'm sure many people will recognize it, unfortunately. And of course, of course, um, he got priority over the house since yes. he was married, and she was a single woman. Yes, yes. So he needed he needed the space for his family. Now, I 
I need to tell you when I when if I go back and remember about you know writing the script, and I had these pages of long pages, many pages of of, of dialogue, and I was thinking, what am I going to do? with the film, when you said that death is a character in the film, there's one other character in the film, which is very important to me, and not as personal maybe, but still an important element, which is the car. I mean, I'm not very much into cars, even if I drive cars every day, I'm not very interested in cars. But, but I remember that in my childhood, we have this sort of funny looking little green van. My father was interested in birds and, and, and he was, he was feeding birds and, and also out in the forest he was he was seeing to it that in the harsh nordic winter they would have you know nourishment and food so he would use this van uh in his hobby and and so we had a funny looking little car exactly the same kind of car that you see in the movie and when i remember this little van this little green van i thought well this van is like the little shuttle between the world of sorrow which is the home, and then the ordinary world. So you go between the ordinary and the extraordinary world with this little space shuttle, little funny green space shuttle. And, and, and when I sort of remember this car, for me, that was the opening of writing the film. I thought, okay, this is the car. And then you have like father and son like this in a two shot. And like in an in aquarium, you sit there or in an elevator, you know, you're stuck with someone in an elevator and eventually someone has to say something. And so it was with me and my father as well. We were sitting in that car, my father and I, and sooner or later, somebody had to say something. Usually we were getting into arguments. Later, luckily when I got older, we had good discussions and our relationship was friendly. And, and, and so I remember my father very fondly, but I also remember times when it wasn't like that. So this car that you see in the movie, uh, which is kind of a comic element, was also for me the key to writing the film in many ways. And what a moment in the film when the father says to his son, you drive. <laughs> and, and, yes, yes. And, like, so, like, like many Scandinavian fathers, this father isn't, isn't, uh, you know, the one to cherish his son or to, to cheer him on or to give him compliments. It's more like you go, you go the other way, you say, you should remember to be careful or watch out for this and watch out for that. And, and, you know, don't do this, don't do that. And I guess many fathers over here at least used to be like that. I, I was fascinated as well by the inanimate objects in the film like the birdhouse, the birdhouses, yeah. and, um, and of course the, the lamps. But um, so the, the father was passing time making a lot of birdhouses. Yeah, because, because doing, doing some handiwork or building birdhouses or watching, you know, looking for, 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 for different species of birds, uh, that doesn't involve human beings. And so human beings are difficult, but being out in the nature or building things, that's easy because you don't have to consider other people. And, 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 uh, and so uh, that's very much, I think, how many people here mourn uh, when, they are, when they feel sad, they go to be alone instead of, so in, instead of socializing or, and looking for comfort. And still, I mean, the real comfort isn't so much to be found when you're alone, it's it's to be found in other people and sort of finding new perspectives and and, and new openings, if you will. Um, I I was fascinated as well by the relationship with the squirrel because my, uh, my father had an ongoing battle of keeping the squirrels from taking the bird food out of the bird feeder. Well, we had the exact same thing, and we have we had in my childhood home, I think, twenty birdhouses around the yard, at least in different trees in the garden. And my father was always watching, you know, where is the squirrel, so he wouldn't eat the eggs or or the 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 the, the, the. so 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 yeah, he didn't like the squirrels because he loved the birds so much. And I I remember that fondly. It was it was a sort of it was a, as much as he loved the birds, he hated the squirrel. When also, um, I, I loved how the clergy mm -hmm. often takes, uh, often gets beat up a little bit 
in, <laughs> in films. Uh, you had comic elements to the film, but you didn't utilize the, 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 the pastor in that, that way. You actually painted a, not a stereotype character at all. You painted a very caring, helpful, um, I mean, he tries, and I think many pastors do uh, over here, uh, where so many people belong to the church, but they're not actually believers. It creates an odd situation where the pastor often visits when somebody has passed away and they want to talk about the funeral and their memorial service and they want to be helpful, but they're they're sort of um, they're sort of on their own, if you will. They, they try to talk to people, but they don't get a lot of feedback, so they try to be as helpful as they can. And in the movie, actually, the, the pastor says some very wise words to, to the family. And, and those were words that I hear heard in actual life too, because when my mother passed away, I was surprised by, by sorrow. And I was thinking like some weeks after, some months after, that why am I still so affected? I mean, it's been a while. And I had no idea as a young man, how long it might take for you to, to, to sort of, be at peace with what has happened and 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 so so there was a doctor actually uh, who, who told me these words it, it was a, th these words in the film that are said by the pastor were actual words and there's he he paints sorrow as a pile of sand and you have to get rid of the sand but you can't come there with an excavator and just take everything away at once you have to do it all by hand which mean which means it's going to take time it's not going to be you're not going to be done with sorrow today or tomorrow you have to give it the time it takes and and for me as a young man hearing those words it was a great relief because i felt quite alone with the sorrow and i couldn't understand what was happening with all my feelings and with my thoughts and why it was affecting me so strongly uh, i'm mourning my mother and and then when the doctor told me this that it's going to take time it was just like saying to somebody, you're allowed to mourn. It's, you're not strange, you're not different than anybody else. It's, it's, it's gonna take time and you haven't experienced it before. That's why you feel it's an odd thing. So don't rush it and don't hurry. Those were great, great words of comfort to me at the time. And so I wanted to, to have them in the center of my movie. And if you watch the movie and you look at your clock, I think it's about in the middle of the movie. Oh, and and uh, it's a giving permission. Yes, it is. It is. And at the moment, at the moment when it's said in the movie, the father is not able to, to, to digest it. He 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 thinks he's done mourning. And I think that's the basic thing that separates the son and the father in the in the film. The, the the son wants to mourn. He wants to talk. He wants to remember. And the father, who's been there with the mother when she was ill. He thinks he's done mourning. He's been mourning for a year now. So he's over he's, and done with it. And I can understand him too. Like if you if you have difficult times, you just want them to be over. And if you if you like now at this time, many people are experiencing hardships and you just want the mourning to come when you feel like, oh, I'm done with it. I'm I can I can go on. But usually they don't go like that, you know, it, they go gradually. And then you notice when you look back at it. Oh, I've been feeling better for some time now, but you don't notice it right away. Usually that might happen too, but that's the way I felt it was with mourning. It took time, but then after a while, maybe it took a year or two, I was able to look back and say, oh, I feel better already. And, and I can look back with a certain amount of gratitude and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, and feeling sort of good even about what has happened with about a thing that I didn't want to happen initially. Yeah. Question about the language in the film. Yes. Uh, what uh, I I had a very very dear friend uh, who was from Rauma. Oh yes. She was a, she said I'm a Rauma flick, which is a, <laughs> for those who don't know that's a combination of Rauma Finish. and a Swedish word and she grew yeah. Speaking a, a combination, and I I was enjoying this combination of language in the film. Can can you address that a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, actually, the film is mostly in Swedish, which is my mother tongue. I I belong to a small minority in Finland that speaks Swedish as their mother tongue. So those of the viewers who 
who are Scandinavian will know right away that, wait a minute, this isn't finished. This sounds Swedish, isn't it? So it's Finnish Swedish, as we call it over here. And, but, but we do mix a lot of words. So, so for instance, the, some of the cursing in the film, there's not a lot of it, but some of the father's harsh words might be in Finnish and there's occasional Finnish here and there. And again, Finns, when they speak Finnish, they take some words in Finland, they take some words from Swedish and use them sort of in between. And if, for me, if I can't remember the Finnish word, I'll use the Swedish. And if I can't remember the Swedish word, I'll use the Finnish. So I've been sort of growing up with both languages all of my life. And, 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 and this is my first feature film in Swedish. And I wanted to make it in Finnish Swedish language because that's the language I grew up with. And that's the language I speak when I'm at home with my family. So being a very personal movie, I, I wanted the language to, to, to be that as well. Now that's one of the reasons the, the film was a low budget film. It, it's not a huge budget. It's a tiny movie with a tiny budget, but still I feel we were able to complete it in a, in a decent way. And I'm, I, I can say honestly, uh, that I'm really, really happy. I, I don't remember feeling this happy of having made any movie than being able to complete life after the death, which I waited to do for so long time. Even, even the, the, the cinematography was so beautiful and how it took uh, the interior shots in the house almost became part of this, the scenes because you had this, uh, the bluntness of dealing with the death Yes. But the the cinematography kept humanizing the place and the people yeah. in, in the in the place. Yeah, I mean, it's not a it's not a bleak movie. It's not an Ingmar Bergman movie. Still, it's I think there are more for me. I mean, you as Americans might see the film as being very Scandinavian, but for me, I would say. The top influences for me are some American independent films. Uh, about Smith, Nebraska, films like that, which are about difficult elderly men. <laughs> and, 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 and so those were, I think, the true inspirations for this movie as well. Well, we, we, we here in America, uh, you'll often hear comments about Americans who spend time in Europe that they'll say, well, in, Ameri in Europe, <laughs> people are allowed to age. Yeah, and here we have so much more of a youth culture, and people mm -hmm. try to hold on desperately. I, I'm I'm fascinated that uh, you're working on a new film that has a has a, a love story between uh, two older people. That's true. That's true. Uh, I've been working for some time with the writers of a previous film I made, A Mother of Mine, Jimmy Carlson and, and Kirsi Wikman, who are a married couple, Finnish Swedish couple actually, they they wrote they wrote a wonderful script called My Sailor, My Love. And it tells a story about an elderly sea captain who who is he's widowed and and he finds unexpected love in a in an in a lady who's also widowed. And uh, and they they well they find it's very honest love hits them unexpectedly. And, and uh, so it's a beautiful love story between two elderly people, two senior citizens. But at the same time, one of the families start opposing this relationship and trying to tear them apart. So it's, again, as you might imagine, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a heartbreaking story, but it's also a heartwarming story. And I was supposed to do that in Ireland last fall now for reasons known to all. Uh, we weren't able to shoot the film. Uh, hopefully we'll do it later this year. We'll see what happens. But that would be with, in Ireland with Irish actors. And uh, my first English language feature, and I look very much forward to, to, to being able to shoot that film. Very, very interesting. So life after life after death looks like my, my sailor, my love, and, and uh, we'll certainly look forward uh, to it. I have to ask you a question for one of our LA uh, writers. Yes. Who, does a, who writes, but she also does a, a little cable TV show and she covers film, but she also uh, covers culinary things. And she's going mm -hmm. to want to know what the heck is a sandwich cake? <laughs> uh, you, you pile toast 
on top of each other and then you put a lot of mayonnaise there or ham or shrimps or whatever so you kind of decorate it as a cake but it's salty that's a sandwich cake and then you slice it like then you slice it yeah and if you ask me i prefer traditional sandwiches to put it mildly uh, yeah as as a musician i would be i would be uh remiss if i didn't comment on this the the musical score of the film oh yes oh so yes interesting and so well done can you tell us a little bit about oh yes oh yes i was able to work once again with with matti buye who is a swedish film composer he's done scores for pernilla august or jan troel he's a very interesting composer you should listen to him in Spotify, Spotify, Matti Buye. It's written like bye bye, B Y E. He's a wonderful composer who started his career some 30 years ago composing as a young man for silent films, classical Scandinavian silent films. And then he sort of grew from there and now he's making film scores is very much in demand, but a most sensitive and a wonderful musician. And we had a wonderful collaboration in one last deal who was the film I did before this. And he was a guy I wanted to work with for, I guess, also almost 20 years since my first feature film, Elena, when I saw one of his silent films and I was so moved, not his film, I'm sorry, but his music. I heard his music for one of the classical Scandinavian silent films. I was so moved by that music. So now I, this was the second film I, I was able to do with him. And, and it's wonderful to work with a musician who's not just thinking about his music and how it will come across, but who's really living the story and breathing the story and sort of living the characters as he is. Uh, so I really look forward to working with him again. Yeah, Matti Buye is his name. Wonderful, even, wonderful person. Even the little touches like, um, like the piano being an old, not yeah. being the concert, Steinway on no no he has a little I have to tell you he has, he has a little he has a little studio in Stockholm and I he think he has a, at least a dozen of different kind of pianos or organs there and none of them are tuned right they're all old pianos and he's done different things to them to make them sound well how would you put it nicely interesting and 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 he he kind of enjoys that not perfect sound uh which makes and, and it, it was so fitting for this film because it's about it's really a film about normal people with flaws and 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 so it was so fitting befitting that the music would also have its own kind of flaws and at the same time the music was inspired by as it often is his music often is by scandinavian folk music or or sort of hymns, and so there's a sad and sweet, sweet sadness and sweetness to it, you know, simultaneously. Sometimes there's perfection in imperfection. Oh yes, um, oh yes, very and, much so. Uh, and so wonderfully done. Well, what can we say? But thank you for this wonderful film, and we're going to look forward to the next one. Um, I must say that in in all the years of the of the festival, we've had every Klaus. Uh, I'm not sure, not your shorts and things from other times. No, but every feature film. That's right. Had every feature film, and it's people ask for them. Oh, when are you going to have another film by? <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you. As you can see from my cup of coffee here. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm longing to be back. Well, we're longing to have you back and and uh, wish you all the best with your projects and with life. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you. Good to talk with you.